Stephen Ham Stephen Hamilton is an artist and art educator in Boston, Massachusetts. Stephen's work incorporates both Western and African techniques, blending figurative painting and drawing with resist dyeing, weaving, and wood carving. Each image is a marriage between the aesthetic perspectives and artistry of both traditions. As a Black American trained in traditional West African forms, he treats the acts of weaving, dyeing, and wood carving as ritualized acts of reclamation. He uses traditional techniques and materials native to West Africa to reclaim ancestral knowledge disassociated from Africans in the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade. The work explores and heavily references the Black body in pre-colonial African art history, creating visual connections between the past and the present. This forms a body of work which serves as a conceptual and visual bridge between the ancient and modern worlds. Through this, he explores elements of Black identity through time and space on its own terms, through visual comparison of shared philosophies and aesthetics amongst Black peoples, he seeks to describe a complex and varied Black aesthetic. These visual and philosophical connections and cultural analyses form his visual language. The pieces created depict African thought and culture as equal to, yet unique from, its Western analog. This work stands in stark contrast to the pervasive negative associations, which have become synonymous with Black culture. His work therefore bridges dialogue between contemporary Black cultures and the ancient African world through an asset-based lens. Wow. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. I am thrilled to have this conversation with you today. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm very excited to talk with you today as well. <laughs> Your art is the the kind of art that the very first moment one experiences, and I can speak from my own perspective, it is immediately captivating. Um, and there, there there's a resonance that that immediately, you know, speaks. It, it, it cuts through the layers. You know, oftentimes, especially working at a museum. I see art and, and I start to like break it down. What is the form? What is, you know, the composition that this artist has there? Your work cuts through to something that's that's uh, innate. It's indigenous. It, it, there's there's some kind of ancestral spirit that immediately pops out. And, and so just the work just resonates so much. Thank you so much. That means a lot to hear. That, that means a lot to hear. I, I definitely want the work to have that resonance of people. Um, especially people of African descent, thinking about how, um, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into the work. There's a lot of intentionality and the material and the symbolism that I use. But I'm also thinking about just for everyday people, um, what does it look like to have a shared experience when looking at the work um, from the point of view of a cultural insider and sort of experimenting with this idea of what are these shared experiences for us as Black people, even when you're using um, imagery, which you may not immediately be familiar with. So um, even though like not every viewer may understand like the deep uh, philosophical references or even um, the very particular uh, types of visual language that I'm utilizing that's referencing ancient Africa or referencing these very specific cultural experiences um, on the African continent, there's still something there. Um, that is resonant and something there that people recognize or see a sense of familiarity with. Um, and the fact that you feel that way makes me happy because it means the work is doing what the work needs to do. Oh, the, the, work, the work is definitely performing some work out, out here in the universe. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're doing something, you're definitely moving some spirits here. Um, before we jump into to any more content, where are you joining us from right now and, and, and how are you doing? I'm 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 doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm joining y'all from Boston. Um I just got finished with a, a, a very long day. Um I'm also um uh I'm a student and, and I'm a teacher, so uh I taught today and I, I went to lectures today. Um so you know that's where I'm like joining you from and that's sort of where I'm at right now. Um, I'm from Boston originally, so my family's from West Virginia. Uh, they um, came up here, they came up here in the 60s, like my grandmother moved to DC, had my mom um, and my uncle, and then she moved up here uh, from, moved from West Virginia to DC, then from DC here, 
um, with her siblings. Um, and they've lived here since like um, the late 60s, uh, early 70s. Um, I grew up in Roxbury. I'm still living in Roxbury right now. Um, and that's a big part of my experience as an artist. Because uh, many people may not know this, but Boston is home to a um, very beautiful tradition of public art. And there's a very, uh, very supportive and, and brilliant uh, Black artist community here in Boston. So I wanted to, mm. again, fix that. It's like Boston is not just a place where I'm at at the moment. It's also a place where I have roots. Um, it's a place where I'm from. And it's also a place where I'm part of a community of other artists. That that that's that's amazing and yeah thank you for for you know illuminating that for us um, I think it's you know it, it also I think it's important when artists are working in their hometown and you know bringing especially someone you know who's traveled the world like you have someone who is advancing themselves through advanced schooling but also you know giving back to your community as an educator to to bring that right back to and I love that you said Roxbury. So, so it's not just Boston, but you're like claim, claiming your specific <laughs> neighborhood. <laughs> if you're from Boston, you'll, you'll know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, so yeah, going going back, you know, to your childhood or or wherever that this happened with, within your development, what sparked your initial interest in art? And what was this defining moment for you when you decided to become a professional artist so there's many different influences so like as like a young person like many young people i loved cartoons i loved video games i loved all of these different types of media uh, that's focused on drawing and illustration and storytelling visual storytelling so i i credit that as part of it like just being a nerd and growing up and watching x-men saturday and saturday mornings and then you know my uncle like having like comic books that he had that i would look at and i would like read uh, playing video games. Um, and then again, this is also like very uh, illustration informed media. Uh, and then also growing up in a city where public art was so important. So uh, walking around my neighborhood, walking around my community and seeing murals. So I remember looking at Africa is the Beginning, which is a work by Gary Rickson on the side of the Roxbury Y. I also went to summer camp there like as a young person and um, just being in awe by these like images, looking at uh, works by Dana Chandler and Paul Goodnight. I remember I, I talked about the experience of going to a shop in Roxbury called Nubian Notion. Uh, and you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, this would have been the early 90s where my mom lived there, uh, they would sell greeting cards, uh, they would sell prints by black artists. And, Paul Goodnight would always have his work in like these big books of like prints. Um, and I remember seeing that along with like other artists, um, uh, other black artists that were creating work nationally. Uh, and a bit before I was born, Nubian Notion was also known for importing like uh, incense and oils and African clothing and other types of objects. It was very much um, sort of this uh, store that created this sort of cultural link between Africa and the diaspora. A lot of the muralists who were working in Boston from the six from the late sixties into the early nineties um, were creating work that was informed by talking about those connections between Africa and diaspora. So that was something that was very conscious in the sort of public art scene in Boston. And even though I'm not a graffiti artist at all, <laughs> um, a lot of the graffiti artists in Boston uh, that were operating in the like late nineties, like in the nineties and then the late nineties, you know they were also growing up in an environment that was looking at that too. So I think that was also a part of that genealogy. And if you look at contemporary muralists in Boston, a lot of them are also looking at these artists that were working in the 60s and the 70s. So that's also a part of my sort of artistic genealogy, looking at these artists who are sort of creating this work, talking about Black identity and also thinking about this connection between Africa and the diaspora. So I credit a lot of the nerdy things that I liked as a kid and I still like now, uh, as well as this, this public art that I just sort of grew up um, uh, experiencing as a person. Oh, that's incredible. So, you know, I, I, I also noticed, I want to say it was on your website, that your background is an illustration. Um, can you talk about this transition that you had from illustration to going into fine art. I mean, I think 
I, I can see how, I mean, actually, I, I don't want to say like a transition because I noticed that you also have a book going on, but yeah. your main emphasis really has been on, you know, being a visual artist, particularly with these paintings, drawings, weavings, and we'll get into that stuff as well. So I went into illustration because I'm very committed to visual storytelling, and that's what illustration is. So illustration for me is thinking about how are you telling stories? How are you relaying narrative through art making? So I very much consider myself an illustrator now, even though I'm working more in the realm of fine arts. I also move back and forth between the two because some of the media that I've come up with or that I've developed over the course of the past uh, five or six years have been my comic books, have been you know work that's very much uh, uses processes that you would see with concept art, um, so I very much still identify as an illustrator. And I don't think that it was really too much of a transition because basically what I was thinking about was I'm interested in telling these particular types of stories. I'm interested in relaying particular types of ideas. That's also incredibly important to my art artistic praxis. Um, and then thinking about the format in which I'm doing that as going beyond simply thinking about this as something which is meant to be reproduced in print media. So thinking about, you know, there there is an element of like print media and like digital media that I'm really interested in and think and so very much engaged with in terms of uh, teaching, in terms of like relaying stories. But there's also a huge focus on materiality and sort of like these uh, experiential um, elements of the work, because even though, you know, with the images that you're seeing now, or the images that you're about to see that are on the screen have a very different resonance on the screen. I'm also mm -hmm. thinking about what it looks like to experience them in real life. Uh, what is the significance of the physical material? Um, what is the meaning of the physical material? How does that uh, relay certain ideas that are inherent to the work? And what does it look like to create worlds? World building is a huge part of mm -hmm. my work and my practice. And I think uh, for Black people, especially Black folks who are interested in uh, the African past, uh, there is a necessity for world building and world construction uh, when it comes to introducing people uh, to that like incredibly rich world sense and also giving credibility to that world sense and legitimacy to that world sense through my practice. So all of those things are are you know, still very much a part of my work. Like world building is a huge part of, you know, video game franchises. It's a huge part of, you know, animation franchises and like all of these other things that are like for, you can make the debate about capitalist consumption and all those other things. But there is something incredibly rich about wanting to be immersed in a world, wanting to be immersed in that experience. And there's a powerful way in which that can be used to educate people or to think about things in new ways. When you are immersed in a world, you are uh, sort of forced to spend more time there. You're forced to notice nuance and all of these other particular details uh, in the, those spaces. And so I borrow a lot of that from how people engage with popular media, how people engage with sort of um, like animation and games and things of that nature. Um, and sort of like create work, which is still very much informed by that aesthetic because I'm engaged with that a lot as somebody who likes that media, mm -hmm. um, but also thinking about that its power uh, in terms of immersing people in uh, like very convincing storytelling. Um, and, you know, I think that I'm successful in different ways. I think that it's it diverges from that in other ways, but um, that's still something that's incredibly uh, informative to, to my work and my practice. Yeah, I love I love that you're thinking about you know this concept of world building and applying it to the work that you're you're you immerse yourself in, and then us the visitors also get to experience through this very immersive fashion. Through, I mean, we're we're we'll we'll get into the materials of like oh this you know there's, there's a part of me that's like oh I can't stand him because he <laughs> works. He works in so many materials and so many methods and you master them all. And that's just, you know, you just are a savant when it comes to that. It, it seems like anything you pick up, <laughs> you, you are mastering. You're not, you're not doing it. I don't want to 
I'm not going to portray myself as a master because, like, I I know those masters, so I don't want to. I don't. Wanna, I'm, well, I'm, I, I get to. I get to. I appreciate, to. <laughs> I appreciate the sentiment, <laughs> but I like I, I I know I know the masters of wood carving and weaving and mm. dyeing. Except my role as a novice in those things, I know. Okay, my I love. I, <laughs> I can I can respect that, and I love the humility with it. Um, you know, I I would just kind of want to go go into a little bit um your experience in Nigeria and you know the the role that that played on you know both the methods that you employed to create your work but also um the subject matter and the histories that you engage with so I was very interested in uh Yoruba art and culture Yoruba people um one of the largest ethnic groups in West Africa, uh, their religious practices are some of the most easily recognizable in the Americas. Um, there are many other Western, West Central African uh, ethnic groups whose religion and philosophy are incredibly impactful uh, in the Americas. So the Yoruba people are by no means the only group, um, but their, their religion and their philosophy and their language is the most easily recognizable in the Americas. And part of the reason has to do with the very tragic history of the uh, transatlantic slave trade they were uh, overrepresented in some of the last groups that were brought over to the Americas. Um, but I was always really interested in that because, you know, in, in terms of Yoruba religion and philosophy, there's these grand pantheons of deities and this incredibly rich and complex worldview and these very deep, complex interactions between these deities that play out in a very rich body of very well recorded oral literature. That is very well recorded in Ifa in uh, Oriki, and all of these very beautiful forms of uh, oral literature um, and verbal artistry for the Yoruba people. So that was something that I was very interested in ever since I was in high school, you know, reading books about it, um, also looking at very janky websites about it. This is back <laughs> like in the early, this was back in the early 2000s. So a lot of like, no verified information from like these websites, but uh, also reading books about it. So reading Robert Ferris Thompson's Flash mm. of the Spirit, which is like one of my introductions, also his work Black Gods and Kings. Um, so when I had the opportunity to actually travel to Nigeria um, and to learn not only about traditional weaving, wood carving, dyeing, but also to uh, work with Olorisha, to uh, work with uh, Baba Lawo, to actually have the opportunity to interview and have conversations with people it very much enriched my knowledge of that world sense, but also helped me understand the deep complexity of those religious ideas and those philosophical ideas. Um, and learning that while also learning these uh, art forms also helped me understand how intertwined these ideas are um, and how deeply tied um, to like the fabric of existence like these, these forms of verbal artistry and also these uh, physical art forms are. So one of the striking um, moments is like uh, having the opportunity to learn uh, Eche from, Eche from uh, Ifa. So uh, there's one from uh, Ikameji, uh, which is one of the uh, Ojo Ifa that talks about the origin of Adire. And um, it's such a fascinating story because uh, it talks about um, uh, Ayirin, which is like white cloth, uh, who sought protection from his enemy who was trying to poison him with dye. So he mm. sacrificed, he was told to sacrifice um, a chicken, he was chose, chose to, uh, uh, told to sacrifice pop um, and uh, amongst other uh, things. And the story goes that, you know, he was able to defeat his enemy that was trying to poison him with dye and he did not poison him, only make him more beautiful. And the idea is that and she came in the night and painted on his body with the pap from the chicken feather, which is what Adire Leko, which is the uh, form of resist dying, which is um, very prominent in Moshobo and parts of uh, Adikuta, it sort of analogizes this, uh, this uh, process in which um, the uh, cloth is painted with pap uh, with the chicken feather. Um, and that was like just like a brief you know, summary of the poem, but the poem itself has so many layered meanings. Um, the way that the language is used also plays off of like metaphor and other words um, and other forms of like wordplay. Uh, but it also like talks about uh, this sort of uh, way in which Adiri is used to tell uh, 
uh, story about uh, the attempts at uh, defeat and the attempts at um, sort of like marking and being uh, destroyed or uh, the, the plots of one's enemies in which Ifa can uh, protect, not only protect you against, but also in which uh, you can be beautified by them. So you can be um, made stronger and better by them through, through the, this act of sacrifice. And it also talks about the importance of cloth in Yoruba religious practice, which is also present in so many different verses from Ifa. So many verses talk about cloth. So many verses analogize the body with cloth. The body is dyed with substances, is dyed with sacred dyes um, at the beginning of creation. Uh, other words and like metaphors in which cloth is um, uh, associated with community, where cloth is associated with the human body, um, where cloth is associated with immortality. Um, and learning all of those different things as I'm learning the process in which cloth is produced, in which it's made, and also learning the other uses for dyes and for um, cloth as a material, as medicine, um, as a ritual object, you know, it, it helped me understand the depths of this as a spiritual and religious experience far beyond this like sort of like quote unquote mythology that you know i i understood it as like before i went to nigeria mm. um, sort of stage where it's like i want to find the black version of zeus and like hera and aphrodite like you looking for the black version of these other forms of uh, grand mythos that you experience in other um, other more accessible uh, traditions and learning about it on its own terms, like not only allowed me to understand its richness and its depth, but also for me to see my relationship with it as being so much deeper, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Oh, no, that makes absolute sense. I love it. Thank you so much for, for telling the story and also telling it in that way and just I mean, just the richness, how you broke down, just, you know, we're, we're looking at indigo dye, um, you know, used in, in a dirt, broke it down. So like, no, it's not just simply this decorative um, technique that, that is just embedded into all of the, the philosophy, the way of life, really, um, and understanding of creation. Thank you so much for breaking that, that entire thing down, um, applicating, you know, the things that we may think about it or the things that we may be told about this history and this culture that you're referencing and paying homage to. Um, I, I also uh, want to know a little bit about, you know, I, I think your, I think your work, I, I, I really noticed it hitting a lot of uh, social media and, you know, after 2020, and so I, you're, I know that you're going back and you're reclaiming these histories, this culture, this knowledge that was cut off um, or, or not, not off, but uh, maybe concealed through transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so I just kind of wonder if your work has had any transition or change. You're dealing with so much history. Wow. How has the, this, this moment from 2020 when you know, thank you, thank you, Susanna, that, that we're also just not even told these histories. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm also just wondering, uh, has this call for Black lives that started or, or intensified in 2020, right? If you're Black, you've already known that this has been a problem, mm -hmm. but now suddenly the rest of the world is like, oh, you guys are actually telling the truth and there's this <laughs> issue, we gotta do something about it. Um, you know, and then also just this whole history of being in the United States to know, you know, you growing up in Roxbury, you have been impacted by the same lining under communities, the things that experience here in Oakland, um, or we do in San Francisco, where Moad is located. Have yeah. any of these moments had any impact on your artwork and, and the, the histories that, that you're contending with? So the 2020, I think that the thing about it, um, the 2020 moment is like, I'm just going to be honest. Like there were a lot of people who, you know, were feeling guilty about, mm -hmm. you know, everything that was going on. That was very much a continuation of things that have been happening for decades, things that have been happening for years. 
So, you know, everything sort of was coming to a head, but it was, it was no, it was not really different from like the systemic violence that black people have been facing since we ended up in this country, mm -hmm. since we were brought to this country against our will. So, you know, there was, um, uh, there were a lot of people who were sort of like interested in my work because like I was a black artist who was creating work about black people. Um, but, you know, we're still trying to figure out like what the political uh, significance of the work was for that moment. Um, during that time period, I thought that there were other artists or other people who were doing really interesting things that I thought was were more significant, um, specifically around community building. Um, and I think that uh, where my work sort of fits in that is the realization that this is a, a systemic problem. So a realization for some people, because again, other, other people like knew that this was a problem. This is not a new conversation that we're mm -hmm. having. Mm -hmm. people. We're not, this is not a new conversation we're having as a community, but people realizing that this is a systemic issue. So what does it look like for us to look for other ways in which we can sort of construct uh, uh, systems and institutions that serve us as Black folks um, and really beginning to unlearn uh, these uh, sort of question our dependency on these uh, systems and institutions that are not only incredibly violent, but exist at our expense. Um, so with my work, what I'm really interested in doing is really challenging the idea of, uh, you know, Western white supremacist universalisms. So this idea that there is this one possible way in which you can construct a world uh, mm -hmm. that is situated away by default um, and that there are no other alternatives or other perspectives. And I think that that is one of the constant um, sort of like challenges that, uh, you know, when we're thinking about Black thought and aesthetic, that's like one of the challenges that um, it presents. So it offers different ways of thinking about the world and the construction of the universe. And that's what makes them, uh, that's what makes it uh, inherently subversive. So when we're looking at um, Black, if we're looking at like sort of the root of you know, the Black radical tradition, or if you're looking at the roots of, you know, Black struggle and resistance um, in the Americas, they're very much rooted in these um, philosophical and cosmological systems of Africans. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at the Haitian Revolution, if we're looking at um, the Vesey plot, if we're looking at, like, all of these forms of resistance in the Americas, Oftentimes they're structured in this world building in this uh, uh, cosmology, which is deeply rooted in African religion and philosophy. Uh, so um, it's very much uh, understood that this is a generative space in which black people can create and build worlds, but that is a threat to the status quo, mm. which is the reason why there's been for so long all of this pressure um, to eradicate these traditions, to eradicate these beliefs, for uh, to get Black people to um, uh, discard these religious beliefs and also to make them illegal or um, to make them, uh, uh, to make it so people who uh, follow these traditions or buy into these worldviews or world sense um, that they're sort of blocked from the quote unquote privileges that are associated with assimilation into mainstream quote unquote Western society. So my work, you know, it's very much informed by art history. It's very much informed by history, but I joke around, it's like very much in a floating timeline. Like it's not pinpointed to one particular uh, 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 time, um, but it is very much rooted in a world sense, uh, which is deeply African. And it's claiming that this world sense is as rich and as complex and as generative um, as any other. And by saying that, you are allowed to imagine something outside of this white supremacist system. Um, and it gives you a space to understand that this is a world that was fabricated. It is a world that was created. It is a world which comes out of you know, transatlantic slavery and colonialism is something which is constructed. It is not something that is a given 
And it mm. also is something that is like immutable. So there are other possibilities that are possible. Um, and, you know, if we understand that there's other possibilities, if we understand that there's other worlds, that there's other ways of thinking, um, it sort of challenges the sort of zero sum uh, constructions um, that, you know, these systems are able to profit off of. Uh, and I think that that's something that's very important for me as somebody who is a student of history, very much a student of history and is still very much figuring things out, but also as an artist uh, saying that like, there is something rich and beautiful and complex and challenging and sticky. It's not all like this utopian vision of pre-colonial Africa where everything's great and everyone gets along. But, you know, this is something that has the same philosophical and conceptual depth and richness as any other tradition. And if we take it seriously, if it's something that we take seriously, we could use this as a space in which we can generate new ideas for ourselves. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of like-minded folks during that period of time, and I'm not gonna speak about like the guilty people who are reaching out to me on Instagram asking if they can share my work so they can make themselves feel <laughs> talking about oh, like, other black folks who are really interested in doing that it was um, a moment where we were able to sort of see each other more, I think, because, you know, there was like a heightened visibility where we were able to see each mm -hmm. other more. Um, and I do think that there were other organizations that were doing very important work in community for a long time, were able, were able to raise money and build followings off of that. So that is something that I, I do think um, is important that I am very grateful for. But in terms of that as a moment, it also really sort of solidified you know, what does it look like for me uh, to think about my artistic praxis um, as very much tied to an educational praxis and very much tied mm. to a community practice and really thinking about what are the next steps for, for me as an artist and as a creator and as an educator and thinking about like, what does it look like to think about this on a, a, a larger scale? Um, but, you know, it still was an extension of work that I was doing for a long time. So I worked uh, as a mentor at Artists for Humanity. You know, I worked at uh, Art Art. I did a lot of work uh, with art education just for young people in Boston. And I was already thinking about what does it look like to develop my own community-based programming? Um, but I think that 2020 sort of like revealed a level of urgency Mm -hmm. um, also solidified my, I don't want to say disillusionment, but I, I sort of solidified uh, my beliefs in the fact that like systems, the, these existing systems and institutions don't serve us. And there has to be alternatives. There has to be other ways in which we can think um, about uh, educating young people and other ways in which we can think about building or constructing community and worlds, other ways in which we can think about history, other ways in which we can think about teaching, um, other ways in which we can think about uh, connecting with each other. Um, and it sort of revealed a sense of urgency behind that because we, we, we you know, we, were, we're, we knew this already, but we're constantly reminded about the violence of that, of these mm -hmm. existences. Ooh. Powerful, powerful. Thank, thank you for, for going there on, on that one. Um, and I want to I want to dive into your artwork. Now. I'm going to pull some of, some of that up. Uh, I love all these reactions floating up, uh, <laughs> coming here. Yes, uh, you just tell it like it is, and I appreciate that so much. Um, we're gonna jump in here. I'm gonna hopefully get this right this time. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work for me properly. Uh, there we go. My oh shoot, I'm not at the beginning. I'm sorry. Let me start this over. I'm gonna go to the very first slide. All right, to your work. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. My closed captioning popped on on here. Um, no and, and if folks want closed captioning, you can turn it on, but I don't wanna fill that up for everyone. So this amazing, gorgeous, stunning work. I mean, we're, I've already kind of broke down a little bit. I mean, you do the weaving, you do the wood carving, you do the, the painting, the drawing, the, I mean, all of it. Can, can you talk about the processes that you employ to create such stunning work? Oh my God, it's, 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 it, uh, I, I love doing it. I don't want to make it seem like it's just like tedium. <laughs> like, 
But um, so this piece is called Worshippers of the Water Spirit. It comes from a series called Between the River and the Forest, um, which is a series I worked on in 2021 and 2000. Well, I was working on it from 2019 to 2022. Um, and it was a, a series that came out of a photo series that I did in collaboration with my cousin, Stacey S. Hamilton, who's an amazing photographer. Uh, and they're all portraits of Black folks um, from the Boston, like New England area. Uh, and it was exploring gender and gender power uh, in African religion and philosophy, and also looking at African art history um, and iconography. Uh, and this uh, piece incorporates handwoven elements. So the area that you see in the middle with the decorative pattern, the blue, beige, and um, black striped um, uh, piece that's in the middle that's handwoven, that's woven on my ofi, which is my, um, my ofi, which is my uh, uh, upright loom. It is um, made with uh, fibers which are dyed with indigo and kola nut. Uh, the red burlap is dyed with barwood powder, which is a um, natural dye uh, extracted from different forms of um, different types of uh, uh, red heartwood uh, that's from a genus of tree native to uh, parts of Western West Central Africa called uh, Terracopis, part of Terracopis genera. This is Terracopis soyaxi. Um, in Congo, they would call it Tukula. Uh, in Yoruba, you would call it Osun, which is uh, camwood. Um, camwood is typically designated from a different uh, bush, but um, the chemical which makes the red color is the same for both types of mm. um, plant. Uh, the top part is um, denim, which is dyed with indigo and kola nut, and the um, frames on the side are um, made out of embossed brass and copper. Um, and again, the the imagery and the symbolism that I'm using is all sort of related. So the two figures that are on both sides. Uh, that's those are images of uh, Amanda Shea, who's at the uh, who's at the uh, left. Uh, she's an amazing poet um, from Boston, Mass. Um, amazing poet um, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, the other one on the right is my one of my cousins, <laughs> Lanisha Flavius. In the middle is Love one it. of my, um, is Rico, who was one of my former students at MassArt. I also was a professor in the illustration department at MassArt for a number of years. Um, but this is in honor of a very rich world of imagery tied to the worship of water spirits in different parts of West Africa. The images of the two women that are flank flanking Rico um, is uh, that are uh, flanking that are flanking um, Rico. Those uh, images are um, based off of uh, Efik, not Efik, uh, Ejigum women uh, from the Cross River region. Um, and it's uh, looking at the worship of Nim, which is a powerful river spirit uh, from the Cross River region, um, worshiped by the Asian people. Robert Ferris Thompson talks about um, the uh, Nim Association, which is also a women's initiation association, initiation society from that region. But it also talks about the power and the ambivalence of water spirits. Nim, the crocodile spirit, is um, life-giving and generative, but also very fearsome and um, sort of threatening. Um, but there, uh, the women that are associated with Anim, which is also tied to other forms of um, uh, uh, other forms of like women's initi women's initiation and education in the region, is associated with the quote unquote fatting house, which is where young girls uh, go and they transition into a uh, womanhood um, through uh, practices of ritual initiation and other forms of like education that's tied to uh, becoming wives and mothers, but also associated with this very powerful um, society of priestesses um, that also have material power, like actual instrumental power. Mm. Um, but uh, the imagery is borrowing from it, like um, a lot of different sources. One of the iconic Ejigum uh, uh, skin covered mask where you see these very beautiful towering spiraled uh, uh, hair hairdos that the women are wearing. Um, uh, the figure that's holding the pot that is actually based off of a uh, pot that was excavated uh, in the Cross River region. Those pots um, date from as early as I believe the eighth century, probably early, maybe even as early as like the seventh or sixth, sixth or seventh century. Um, but there are these beautiful ceramic pots um, that have um, beautiful patterns in um, iconography, which is associated with uh, the region. Um, there are symbols there that are also 
uh, believed to be the prototypes for incibiti, which is a type of ceremonial writing, uh, graphic writing, which was present in the area, not only amongst the Ejigam, but amongst Igbo speaking people, Bibio speaking people. Um, and uh, a lot of the other uh, images that you see here are, you know, symbols of water spirits. Snakes, pythons are very much associated with water spirits. Uh, fish, specifically mudfish, which are able to breathe air, are often associated with water spirits and this sort of like ambivalent power um, of water spirits who can both live underwater and also breathe um, air. Um, you know, all of the beads in which they're wearing are, are not only symbols of, um, are symbols of wealth, and they're also a representative of both domestic production um, that's also associated somewhat with water. So they're wearing like these red stone beads. Um, they're wearing these uh, beads which are made for sh from shells, but also um, uh, wealth that's associated with trade, uh, specifically Atlantic trade, which is why you see like all of this brass, um, which is, um, was, you know, uh, very much important in that area during the period of Atlantic trade, so in as early as the 16th century. Um, the central figure is based off of a, um, worship images um, showing the worship of Mami Wata, who is also um, a West African deity that's very much associated with uh, trade with the West, um, with European, mm. um, associated with the wealth that comes from that Atlantic trade, um, a very complex deity. Uh, she borrows a lot of the imagery from like uh, mermaids and like like even like images uh, that are borrowed from like um, Indian material, which is coming into West Africa at different points of time, but it's still very much an African water deity as water deities are themselves associated with oftentimes wealth and plenty. Um, and that central figure is uh, based off of an image of an um, Elwe priestess from, uh, Elwe priest uh, from what's now Togo. So um, again, it's like looking at all of these different uh, all of this different art and iconography that relates to uh, the worship of water spirits, but also this like ambivalence uh, that is, is tied to water spirits, this ambivalence and this complexity, which is also tied to gender, as water is oftentimes associated with like feminine power and agency, mm -hmm. but um, also can be somewhat ambivalent. Water spirits oftentimes uh, like embody this type of femininity, but they can also embody uh, sort of like this assertive and like masculine uh, power and tendencies. Water is, you know, understood as something which is nurturing and life-giving, but also something that has the potential for being destructive and life-taking, mm -hmm. which is something which is very much present in the way that people talk about Nim. Like Nim is like uh, the crocodile, <laughs> like the Nim is like, you know, um, this feminine spirit, but also has like these assertive and possibly destructive manifestations as well. Um, so that's that's sort of where that image is coming from. And again, the brass that you're seeing on the edges are, are borrowed from these beautiful embossed um, brass uh, platters that were created by Ejigam women um, in the like 18th and 19th century, 18th, 19th and 20th century. Um, you know, and uh, they're using symbols which are from this massive corpus of Incibiti, which was actually associated with the Leopard Society, which is a men's society in the region. But many of these symbols and many of like those aesthetics permeate ritual life um, throughout the Cross River region. So that's some of the many references that are being made there um, in this piece. Wow. Okay. The the intensity of the research that you conduct um, that goes into each one of your pieces is just incredible. And now now you're a third year in your PhD uh, program. Is is this all kind of the foundation of what will become your dissertation? Is is, is there a direct connection here? From your lips to my advisor's ears, like my, I'm hoping. <laughs> oh, um, most most certainly, most certainly. So, so my work focuses, and you'll see in some of the other slides, there's other um, uh, direct references to textile and textile history. But mm -hmm. what does it look like to sort of create artwork, um, which is not only looking at the technical aspects of tech of um, textile fabrication and creation. So for example, that beautiful red color that you're seeing there is yes. coming from barwood. Barwood um, and camwood were important commodities during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, before the advent of synthetic dyes, 
uh, red was a very, red dyed stuffs were incredibly important The commodities in Africa produced two very important red dye stuffs, that's camwood and barwood. Um, and those are often coming from places where enslaved people are also coming from. Mm. So enslaved people are being brought, carried on some of the same ships that are bringing this uh, barwood uh, to, you know, Britain and other parts of Europe um, where it'd be used to dye clothing there. Um, and that dye is also an incredibly important dye uh, in uh, the textile histories of West and West Central Africa, especially Central Africa. Um, one of the interesting things about my research is that you, you read uh, textile historians saying, you know, one of the reasons why Africans imported so uh, much uh, red silk and, you know, red wools is because there weren't uh, good sources of red dyes. Um, which I think is very odd, considering that one of the major exports of yeah, yeah. Africa was red dye. So, you know, thinking about, okay, what were the processes in which people were um, possibly extracting uh, red dyes from these dye sources? Uh, what are the possibilities of those different colors? What are the special affinities that it has with particular types of fiber? Um, what's the significance of this dye in Africa? Tukula and Camwood, um, these are incredibly important in initiations. They're incredibly important mm -hmm. in medicinal practices. They're incredibly important um, in uh, certain areas uh, to funeral rites, uh, representing blood, representing um, these important moments of transition. Um, there's all of this ritual and spiritual significance uh, for this as a material and also medicinal significance this as a material. Um, you know, it, it's very deep in terms of how um, this is used. Uh, in the African continent. And, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that, but also important to recognize that these, you know, these materials that are being exported to Africa, they have a life on the African continent and they have, you know, a very complex history on the African continent. Um, and there's very deep knowledge of that's associated with them. Um, and, in my own research, like understanding where is that disconnect between how mm. this is spoken of as a commodity and how this is understood as a ritual material and understanding that it, in, on the African continent, it can be understood as both. Um, and I think it's important for me to not only write about that, but also in, in also show this in my practice, you know, to be like, okay, this mm. is, these are the possibilities of this as a material. So we have to understand that when we're looking at textile traditions in Africa in the pre-colonial period, we have to look at this in terms of material culture in the pre-colonial African period. Um, you know, and these are things that are important, important to me, not only as a research, but as a maker, as an artist. You know, mm -hmm. one of the interesting things that I, I, you know, think about is like when you look at writings about Hudu in, Amer in the Americas, they talk uh -huh. about brick dust. They talk about this red brick dust, which is a ritual material. And to me, that's directly borrowed from the ritual use of uh, camwood powder and also red clay um, and red earth in African mm. ritual practice. You know, so understanding I, yeah. because it's tied to, you know, the cultural memory of these types of ritual materials in the African continent. I, I agree with that. You know, and I, I think they're so... Th those are areas where where there's just not enough research. You know, there, there's one person said something 200 years ago, and then that's taken as the truth. You know, yeah. and and it's it's a col probably a colonizer or someone who profited off of slavery who doesn't have you know a deep connection to these things, and and we just take it as, as that's the truth. Um, so I love that you're going into that research and making these connections um, to our practices that that are here in the United States. That you know because of them being passed through oral traditions. We don't even know, you know, the real origins of these. I love that you're going into that. Can't wait to read your research on it. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I'm obsessed with this piece. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so many different ways. And I just want to say, I, I love how on your Instagram um, account, you, you know, you, you, you show the process, you show the the model and the photography, your mock-ups, I mean, all the intense planning that you do that leads us to this stunning, stunning piece. So it's, I mean, the the, the level of research and 
labor that you put into every piece is, is just so evident. But I think particularly with this piece, you really let us into the universe of yeah. just how long and how yeah. hard you work on these things to, to where we end up with this gorgeous image that we're looking yeah. at. Thank you so much. This piece is um is also like I I know all the people that I'm painting. So this is um uh it's called um Amo Batala, he who sleeps in white and awakens in white. That's one of the praise names for Abatala, who's the god of the Orisha of the White Claw, um, or uh king of the white claw. Um uh the other part, he who kills the initiate and arouses them to new life. That is um, also part of the praise poetry for Abatala. Um, and uh, the person who posed for this is Isnar Dupu, who's also an artist and a musician in Boston and a friend of mine. Um, and it's also made in homage of a, a very famous priest of Abatala called Shalako. And Shalako was uh, the uh, priest who dictated the 16 cowries. So, in Yoruba religious practice, you have Ifa, which is the 256 um, Odu Avifa, is considered um, the most complete uh, source of divination poetry um, amongst the Yoruba people. It's given highest authority as a divination practice. It's very ancient um, and is likely also related to other very ancient practices um, that use uh, binary data, 8 bit based up binary um, data in order for to uh and for for divination so there are all these other cognates to you find that are practiced by other um ethnic groups in nigeria but that has a special preeminence um in yoruba land specifically as um, one of the cornerstones of yoruba religious praxis the other form of divination is um erindi logun uh erindi logun is uh the 16 is 16 or 16 calories which is deemed as not as complete as Ifa, so Ifa has 256 possible combinations, 256 Odu. Um, Erin has 16. Um, it's also important to understand the 16 is also relevant in Ifa because there are 16 major Odu. And then you have the um, you have uh, the 16 major Odu and then you have the 250 minor Odu. Uh, but then you, uh, with Erin uh, you have like the 16 um, Odu that are associated with Erin it is considered not as complete, but it is still a very rich source of uh, divination poetry. And there are 16 possible chorus, um, uh, uh, 15 possible combinations um, when casting cowries. Um, and each of those possible com uh, combination coincides with a uh, corpus of divination poetry, which is interpreted to determine um, sacrifices which are necessary in any given moment when you're consulting the priest. You'll oftentimes see Obatala priests and also Ash Ashun priestesses and priests um, who are practicing 16 calories, as well as other um, uh, Olorisha. Uh, but Shalako was a um, uh, Obatala priest who dictated uh, the 16 calories to William Baxcombe. Um, and one of his favorite, famous publications um, not only gave uh, information about his life and his apprenticeship, but also spoke about um, like his eloquence um, as an orator um, and as somebody who contained a vast knowledge of the 16 calories. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about um, Shalako is uh, because of the particular type of um, priest he was, there was an interesting way in which he, he, he sort of presented into the world, um, seeing him in his white uh, cloth. Um, um, he did not uh, cut his hair. He wore his hair in braids, which is a traditional woman's hairstyle, as did many uh, particular types of Abatala priests um, did during that time. Um, and uh, he was remembered as a very knowledgeable priest during this transitional period in Yoruba, um, in Yoruba land. So, you know, thinking about him as somebody who's caring for that tradition during this point of transition um, into quote unquote modernity. Um, but he's wearing um, the trappings of um, Obatala priests. He's wearing the, um, uh, it, it almost looks like a robe, but it's not a robe. He's wearing, Allah, he's wearing um, a large white cloth um, that's woven, that's worn over his shoulders. Um, uh, like a rapper, he's wearing a gele, um, he's wearing uh, white beads, he's also wearing uh, shaggy beads, uh, which are a type of blue glass beads um, originating from um, Ife that are still used in Yoruba religious praxis. Um, and he carries, uh, he has like these um, uh, white uh, marks on his skin that are made with uh, white chalk. 
also the background is primed with white chalk, um, which mm. is a material, a poor material in Yoruba religious practice. He and also, this... oh, go ahead. He's also, no, no, I just... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, so he's also flanked by um, uh, cattle egrets. Um, and that's from a verse from uh, Ifa uh, that talks about like three sacred birds. And one of them is uh, the cattle egret. And it says, Leke Leke, which is the cattle egret, dipped its feathers in the immaculate white chalk. And that's like a reference to the chalk that I'm using, um, not only as the prime for the um, canvas, but also for the wood carving um, that I'm using at the edge. Um, the patterns that you're seeing there, that Elosh pattern, that intertwining pattern is something mm -hmm. you see in a lot of different African um, artistic traditions, um, especially in wood carvings in Yoruba land. Um, and uh, the cloth that I painted on is a mixture of canvas and also hand-woven cloth. So the uh, elaborate like open work technique that you're seeing in the middle is the cloth that I wove. Um, uh, which is like white on white. So the, you know, pattern that I'm uh, weaving into the fabric um, is made with like white supplemental wefts on a white ground. Um, and the shaki that you're seeing there, which is like the, the tufting, is something that you see on uh, baby carriers in Yoruba land, but it's also something that you see on a lot of our religious textiles in Yoruba land. Uh, Itagbe, um, shawls that you see in Yoruba land. Um, so even now, if you look at images of um, Yoruba priests and priestesses, you'll see them wearing these shawls that have like this tufting on it. Um, so yeah, I wanted to to do this um, to sort of like think about these different things and to, to look at that tradition while also creating visual references to Ifa and Narindi Logun and also um, Oriki, which is like our praise poetry. Um, and also thinking again about that sort of rich symbolism, which is tied to the worship of Obatala, who, you know, is a deity that's associated with creation, mm -hmm. a deity that's associated with uh, the shaping of mankind, a deity who is actually a pantheon of deities. There's so many different manifestations of Obatala as a king, as a warrior, as a healer, as a sage, as all of these different things. Um, and because of his role, um, in the history of Ilefe, which has, um, which is incredibly significant in the history of the Yoruba people. Uh, it is where um, for many Yoruba people, uh, the world began. Um, the events leading to uh, the foundation of um, Ilefe and the different conflicts between these different ancient figures in Orisha during that period of time uh, would reverberate throughout Yoruba land in terms of like our religious practice. Um, and he's an incredibly important deity for that reason, um, but also as a deity that uh, reflects coolness and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So the idea of sleeping in white and awakening in white is an exercise in mindfulness because this idea of being able to uh, uh, go to sleep wearing white and for your white garments to continue to be white when you wake up, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So um, there is a, a, a sense of that also in that sort of like meditative practice, um, but also this idea of, um, you know, spiritual cleanliness and lightness and purity and this sort of sacred whiteness, which is very different from like racialized identity. Ident yes, yes, 100%. But, um, <laughs> just to clarify that, <laughs> um, which is incredibly important, not only for the Yoruba, but you also see elements of that, this whiteness, coolness, uh, uh, sim symbolic of like sort of these creative uh, forces, ancestral forces. You see that in other parts of Africa as well, especially the ritual significance of white chalk, which, mm, is, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a richly charged substance. It's cold to the touch. It's like sort of gathered from the bottom of like river, river um, beds. It's like, you know, associated with like um, this, this very potent spiritual force. Um, and that's something that I wanted to, um, to sort of relay with this. And then there's also this idea that is also resonant for folks that have backgrounds in, you know, Christian settings, you know, where mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. will know about this idea of like being born again even though this is a distinct tradition, but this idea of killing the initiate and rousing them to new life, this idea in which 
you know, um, you know, this process of initiation uh, marks this form of like transformation um, that I think is like uh, uh, very deeply resonant for people. So that's sort of what I was thinking about when it came to to this piece. Thank you so much for going into that. I can't believe, but we're up at the top of the hour right now. Um, this has been such an incredibly rich conversation that I want to go on for another hour, um, but I also want to respect your time and, and the day that you've had. Can, can you tell us what's, what's next for you? Any shows, fairs, residencies? Um, where can folks see your work next? So, you know, I'm still, I'm still work, <laughs> working on that. Like, <laughs> I don't have any shows that are in the works as of now. I am working on a few, I am working on a collaboration with an artist I admire, so that like keep your eye out uh. for that. Um, but, um, you know, I had the opportunity over the, uh, this, this past, I had the opportunity this past um, uh, summer to work with Kiera Singleton, who's the director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters. Um, I had the opportunity to work with uh, her um, and we ran a summer program and we were teaching um, traditional weaving, well, I was teaching traditional weaving, dyeing, sewing, like all these different fiber arts at the Royal House and Slave Quarters, and teaching that in relation to like the history of uh, textiles in West and West Central Africa, along with, um, you know, uh, textile histories of enslaved people in the Americas. So, um, you know, as an extension of that, I am gonna be uh, running some workshops um in uh in february hopefully mm. <laughs> so like that's the next thing that i'm preparing for um but i'm hoping that i can you know find some time before you know the end of this year to, to dedicate more time to my artistic practice i still have a lot of work that is like in my um I still have a lot of work that's like in my studio and I am developing like proposals for new things. I'm very much open to having shows and exhibitions and, and crafting shows and exhibitions at different galleries and museums. So if people are interested, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to, to, you know, talk about that. But right now, a lot of my focus is just going on school and teaching. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what a lot of my time is dedicated to. Like, As my grandma would say, you got a lot of irons in the fire. You got to keep them all hot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, Stephen, thank you so, so much. Um, wait, wait, hold on. W what does Shadiq was saying there? I got I to see that. Uh, you've done a lot of collab collaborative projects with uh, Nameka and also Shaniqua. Yes. Uh, Why did I forget subject. that? I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. Shaniqua and... <laughs> Shaniqua and Emeka are actually here. I did not mean any shape by that. I had the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Shaniqua and Emeka, uh, Shaniqua Brooks and um, Emeka Aquellum on an amazing garment uh, that's currently at the Southside Community Arts Center. And um, it was an awesome opportunity to collaborate with them. They're both incredibly talented artists. Uh, Shaniqua is a, a, a a uh, master with a sewing machine, mm. but, but they're also good friends of mine who are also black weavers too. Um, and I would encourage you to check out, if you are in Chicago, I would encourage you to check out that show. Um, the show actually is a Mecca show. It, it has like um, uh, a lot of his work that he's done in collaboration with other friends of his and also um, a show that's upstairs um, with another artist. Um, and it's like an incredible, an incredible, uh, um, exhibition and it was a great experience collaborating with them. Me, Shaniqua, and Emeka used to have like these like uh, we, we would get together on Zoom and we'd weave together. And Emeka, oh, love it. Who I taught weaving on the upright loom too, um, and he's taken that and created his own like very beautiful complex practice using gimp lanyard and like playing around with different materials for it. Um, and it's just been doing like really interesting work. So. I'm glad that Shaniqua brought that up because, you know, that's still up. Um, and that was like the last uh, project that I was, um, that I was, that I was working on. All right. So everyone get up there into Chicago to see that. Um, also go back into Moad's uh, In the Artist Studio archive. We interviewed Shaniqua back in 2020. Um, so, so glad, always glad to see her and, and see the artists uh, collaborating. Um, 
Stephen, this has been incredible. I can't wait to meet you in person and carry on with this conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here with us and thank you everyone here also for joining us. Um, we're gonna have our, our next In the Artist Studio uh, next month, so please join us. And if you came late to this conversation, you can watch it immediately uh, following the end of this broadcast on MOAD's Facebook page. And then by the end of the week, we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. And we'll see everyone next time. Take care and have a great night, Stephen. Again, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And thank you for all the wisdom that you, that you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Good night, everyone.